Today I'm going to do a review of the North wood cook stove that we've had for close to two years. So we've got a really long time to be able to test it out, see what we like, see what we don't like, and also develop a few hacks along the way that allows us to optimize how the stove works just through the sheer volume of wood that we put through there. So stay tuned if you're interested in learning more about the North cook stove. Yeah, I'm a human. Let's just go through a quick tour of the stove and how everything works so you guys can get a sense of what is involved in running one of these wood cook stoves, some of the controls and, and how they operate. So down below here, we've got a little warming drawer or a uh, area that you could keep pans and pots and things. We don't use it very often. And as I was uh, getting ready to build this video, I was thinking that, that we, we probably should use it a little more often than we do. Um, we've got the, the firebox right here and I'll go through that in a second. There's also an air wash control up here. So we can control this. This, this basically controls the amount of air coming across the glass uh, right here. There's a primary air control and the stove itself actually has a secondary air as well, but there's no control for it. And the secondary air comes into the back of the stove. And so when this thing's really blazing, additional air is sucked into the combustion chamber, which helps to reburn all the flue gases. And so it's actually a pretty clean burning stove once it really gets ripping. On this side, we've got a dampener that controls the amount of energy going around the cook box, which is where we can do baking and things like that. Um, overall, I have to say that I haven't had a lot of success controlling the temperature inside of the wood cook stove with this particular dampener. We've had to deploy some other concepts and ideas. Uh, and so not overly impressed with the oven control. Uh, when this thing is, is operating, we tend to kind of stay right around the 200 degrees Celsius mark. The thermostat on here is in Celsius as opposed to Fahrenheit. You can change that if you prefer it in Fahrenheit. Um, and I don't really care. I can go between the two. One of the things that I wasn't overly impressed with is that the thermostat started to rust shortly after we got it. So it's a pretty low grade thermostat, uh, which wasn't, which wasn't great. Um, you can see we've used the stove a ton. And, and so whenever any food spills on here, <coughs> things tend to get baked onto it. And uh, we do clean it on a fairly regular basis, uh, but this will accumulate over the course of the winter. And over time, it gets harder and harder to clean the stainless steel. Like it just seems like it bakes into it. And so you kind of just have to accept that as part of the patina of the, uh, the stove itself. One of the things that we had to place into the system is this dampener over here. And so because this stove was designed to burn on both wood and coal, it has a coal grate in it, which means that the air comes in from underneath the wood where it's burning and it burns really fast. Uh, even with controlling the air dampener, it's hard to actually control the amount of air getting into the system, which is why it's difficult to control the oven temperature and even the stovetop temperature. So in order to compensate for that difficult control on this particular model, we had to install this dampener inside of the stack. And so this probably reduces the stack diameter or the, the wetted area inside here by up to 90%. And it really does make a difference. And so by the time I've adjusted this dampener, the oven dampener and the primary air, I'm able to control the fire with quite a bit of, um, precision. And so this was a, an additional add-on that we had to put in in order to give a bit more control. And I recommend it if you get this model of stove. I'm going to use a poker to identify some of the parts on the inside. And so right down there, you can kind of see there's a bit of a grate in there. And I can clean it off a little bit more. So that grate is a steel grate. And it's one of the reasons that this stove can take both wood and coal, which is kind of a nice feature. I don't anticipate wanting to burn coal in here, but it's nice that I've got that option. This is also the reason that the wood cook stove burns so quickly. There's just so much air that can come up here. And so we really get raging fires once this thing gets lit. One of the advantages of that is that we get very clean fires once it gets really hot. But one of the disadvantages is we don't get a lot of control over 
the heat that the stove or the oven gets. And sometimes I get a little bit scared that things are just ripping through there a little bit too quickly. Now you'll notice that the stone here, the refractory brick is cracked both in the back and on the sides. So after two years, I'm, I'm going to have to replace this, which I'm not very happy about. I think that this refractory could have been a bit thicker and stronger. Uh, it doesn't say very much about the overall quality. Um, I don't think it's going to be hard or expensive to replace it, but you don't buy one of these stoves for close to $5,000 and then expect this to happen. So not super impressed with that. Also, the way that the refractory on the top is set up, um, there's supposed to be a stopper in here. The stopper broke pretty quickly. And so when you're putting logs in to the oven, um, you know, this thing pushes back, which then changes the, the path of the flame. And again, that's also not awesome. So I'm not overly impressed with, uh, with that top refractory right here. It's now a little bit more in focus. So I'll just show it to you again. So the oven is quite nice. It's big enough for a full cookie sheet and you can get multiple racks in here. So if you want to have multiple uh, things baking at the same time, it's absolutely possible. Um, I wouldn't need a bigger oven than this. I'm quite happy with the size of the oven. And overall, as long as you're happy cooking at the 300 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 350, sorry, to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, um, this oven is, is fantastic. You'll also notice that there is a clean out down here. And so these screws unthread and then you can get a vacuum cleaner behind this panel. It's pretty easy to take this off. So we can have a quick inspection of this right now and just see how it's it's fairing and whether I need to get in there and clean it out. So there's quite a bit of, of soot in there. It's not too bad. Um, I haven't cleaned it out for probably about a month and a half now. So it's less than I was expecting, but still time for a clean out. And that makes it quite convenient to clean around the oven um, with that clean out tab there. Now the stove itself has zones. And so the hottest zone on the stove is right here in the center where you've got this removable steel circle. And then we've got kind of cooler zones on the front and on the back. And that's because there's refractory brick. So basically when the flame is ripping in the firebox, it's hitting this circle first, and then it kind of spreads out to the other areas. As we move this way across the stove, there's like a center band that's quite hot. And then again, these side areas on the front and on the back are a bit cooler. And then over here where the, the flue comes out is the coolest. And so if you're wanting to simmer something, you just stick a pot right here and it'll simmer. Now this hot plate or cast iron device that we found at an antique store is absolutely essential. Um, I can put this anywhere on the stove, even on the hottest part, and it'll give me the ability to simmer whatever it is that I'm cooking. And so I highly recommend having one or two of these things to help you to moderate the heat going into whatever, whatever it is that you're cooking. So if you're cooking something with dairy in it or that doesn't want as much heat, this helps you to really derate what's coming off of the surface. And then if you want to derate the simmering side even more, you can have this go over here. And so we try and keep hot water or tea like chaga or something like that on our wood cook surface on top of one of these just to slow down the boiling process. And that really makes a big difference. Now, another way that we've managed to control the temperature of the burn in this stove is by choosing specific types of wood. So a piece of wood like this that's quite small and has a lot of surface area is going to burn really, really quickly. And so if you want fast heat or you want to heat the stove up quickly, you're going to want to burn stuff like this. Now, if you want to slow the burn down um, using logs that have a lot less surface area, so anything that's round, essentially, even sometimes a full round log is going to burn way slower. And so you can actually have a lot of influence on the overall combustion uh, by choosing specific types of wood. So we going forward, are going to have kind of round logs um, for slow cooking and then kind of more of that highly processed wood for faster cooking or quicker heat. Overall, I have to say I'm really happy that we have a wood cook stove. Um, like I said, I'm a little bit disappointed in some of the uh, construction components of the stove. And so going forward, if we do choose to 
uh, use a different stove or buy an additional stoves for other buildings on the property. I'm not sure that I'll buy another one of these North stoves. Uh, I am going to get some replacement parts for it and see how hard that is. And I'll report back on that, how hard it is to replace it. Um, one of the big features that I liked about this stove, which we're still probably going to use, is that it had a heat coil in it. And so I can do all of my domestic hot water heating with this stove. So while I'm cooking and heating my house, I have the ability to heat hot water at the same time, which is pretty sweet. Now we tend to use this stove most when it goes below minus 20. Uh, the stove in the other room is a big beast of a unit. It's a catalytic stove. It'll burn for eight hours straight. It puts out about 80,000 BTUs. Um, it depends on the wood that we're burning. If it's poplar, we might only get six hours. If we're using birch, we'll get a full eight, which is really nice because you can stuff it full of wood, go to bed, turn on the catalytic, and it's still going in the morning. And so you don't really have to relight fires in it very often, which I really like about the catalytic. It has its own drawbacks, and I'll do another video about it in the future, kind of comparing the difference between secondary air burners like this one uh, compared to a catalytic stove like the one in the other room. So having the ability to heat hot water was a big feature that I wanted. Um, I've since found other units that do similar things. And so I will be looking into those, but the price of these other units tend to be quite a bit more expensive. So like one of the other units I'm looking at is like $8,000, whereas this one was closer to four, maybe five by the time I had it shipped into Canada. The stove itself is relatively easy to clean. Um, this center piece of steel will come off. And then this whole platen, this whole piece of steel on the top actually gets removed and then I can get in there and vacuum it all out. Um, I also have to remove the flue probably once or twice a year and get up there with a, a brush. Because of the steepness of my roof, I have to do it from the inside, which makes a massive mess and I really don't like it. I do have a solution for that, which I'm working on and I'll make another video about it, but it's a, essentially a small little cap that fits onto the flue so that when I'm sweeping out the flue, um, and getting the creosote out, it's sucking it up at the same time. So it's kind of a, a makeshift attachment that allows me to attach a vacuum while also being able to sweep the chimney at the same time. It's kind of neat. If you're looking for a wood cook stove, um, Obadiah's now carries these stoves and with a whole suite of other ones as well. And so you can kind of compare all the different options. There's a few other companies in Canada that are selling these as well. I think there's a store out of Montreal and one out of British Columbia that sells a variety of different brands. And as we uh, look at these different brands, we'll uh, speak to them as well. I think one of the, one of our, um, teammates has um, an SA stove from Britain, uh, which apparently is a very high quality build, um, quite a bit more expensive, but again, it's probably a multi-generational asset. So we'll do more videos on wood cook stoves in general. The goal for this house is to get to a point where we can heat the house with something as small as this. So the wood stove in the other room, uh, which is a catalytic from Blaze King, as I mentioned, puts out about 80,000 BTUs an hour. Um, that puts out probably four times what this thing puts out. So this thing puts between 15 and 20,000 BTUs an hour out. So quite a bit smaller. And when it gets to minus 40, because of the poor envelope of this house, I actually have to run both of these units simultaneously to keep the house at a good temperature. My intention is that after I re-insulate the house, reglaze it, put new windows in, uh, re-air seal it, and potentially even put a basement on this house, that our total heat loss for this building is going to be satisfied by a small wood cook stove like this, this one or another one. And so then when it gets cold and I need to add heat, I will be able to cook, I'll be able to heat, and I'll be able to heat hot water with it. So I get three different functions out of this particular unit. And then I'll be able to get rid of the really big unit, put it into a different building if I actually still need it. If I don't, I'll end up selling it. The idea from an energy perspective is that we have the smallest number of electrical appliances in the house and that those appliances are gonna be met from a solar array and battery system with the occasional use of generator and also um, the grid addition at the same time. So we're gonna have multiple layers of redundancy for the smallest number of electrical elements that we can uh, in the house. And one of the ways that we reduce the electrical load of the building is by shedding the electrical uh, cooktop that we've got. And so during the summer, spring and fall, we use electricity for our cooking 
And then in the late fall and early spring, as well as the winter time, we'll use this for our cooking. And so the electrical uh, cooking and baking in this house uses the majority of the electricity through the winter season when our solar panels are producing the least amount of electricity. And so this represents a really important part in the overall electrical and kind of energy nexus of the building. And as we move forward, we're gonna be uh, changing how we heat hot water. Currently we do it with propane. Eventually it's gonna, like I said, be coming off of this stove or, or a different stove in the future. Um, we're going to also change how we uh, look at all of the energy systems on this particular property and we'll be reporting on how we think through all of those things as we go forward. One of the other big energy consumers that we're looking at shedding or reducing is the refrigeration and we'll be looking at earth tubes and earth fridges and how to um, incorporate root cellars into our buildings so that we can live without mechanized refrigeration or at least keep it to an absolute minimum. Okay, hopefully you found that useful. I'll make sure I leave a link to Obadiah's and this particular model in the show notes down below. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section. If you use a wood cook stove and you love it, uh, I'd love to know what model you're using, what you love about it. And uh, if you've got videos that you've produced on that wood cook stove, make sure you share it with us and the community. I'm sure people would love to see what you're using to heat, cook, and potentially even heat your hot water. So thanks so much, guys. Make sure you subscribe to the channel for future updates. And if you're wanting more of this type of information and getting access to the writing that I do on a regular basis, head over to our website at vergepermaculture.ca, sign up for our newsletter, and you'll get an update from me on a semi-regular basis on all things to do with permaculture, homesteads, food production, energy management, and pretty much everything that you need to be self-sufficient in this crazy world that we find ourselves in right now. Thanks so much. I'm a human.